Gwendolyn Church coordinates the Friends of Philip Fish Rescue, a small fish rescue operation focused on rescue and education in the San Francisco Bay Area. Friends of Philip rescues and rehomes various fish in need. They broaden the animal rescue conversation to include fishes and to help foster the connection between people and aquatic life by sharing stories of the vibrant personalities of fishes at their rescue sanctuary. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Gwendolyn. Of course. Thank you so much, too, for having me. So I'm always interested to know, how did you find the vegan path, Gwendolyn? Yeah, um, I think probably, you know, really similar to a lot of people. Um, I went vegetarian about <clears throat> actually five years ago this month. Um, I kind of just accidentally came across information about how meat is produced and what happens to the animals in that process. Um, and I found these videos. I went vegetarian on the spot. And for quite, you know, for about six months, I was vegetarian. And then I went vegan. Um, July of 2016, kind of in a similar process of I learned more about dairy and eggs and realized that that also isn't a good thing to support. Um, so, you know, I identified for my whole life as an animal lover and I, I grew up with pets. I've always loved animals and everything like that. And so to just come across that, that information and the realization that how I was living wasn't in line with who I am and how I saw myself was very kind of eye-opening and heartbreaking as most people experience I think um and yeah so that that was kind of it it, it was um a, a reasonably quick transition but has been just so easy and wonderful it's ultimately liberating I feel like yes yeah it, it really really is um and then I I started to get more involved in kind of the animal rescue world I started volunteering at a farm animal sanctuary um near me about three and a half years ago, I want to say, or three years ago. Um, and that just kind of added to that connection with animals and, and with veganism and everything like that. So it's been a really great journey. Cool. And then, yeah, fishes often get left out of the conversation, right? I mean, they really do. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, like, I've heard them referred to as the forgotten food animal. And I think that's really appropriate. Um, they're one of the most consumed animals, but we don't really talk about them. Um, you know, it, with a farm sanctuary, you can go visit cows and pigs and chickens and goats and sheep and all these animals, and you can see what a good life for them is like. But there isn't really something like that for fish. There's there's not really a way that people connect with fish very regularly. And the most the most common connection that we see with fish is someone who has a pet fish. Um, you know, that's how we most frequently see live fish anytime. Um, and a lot of the time, the, the care recommendations that fish are sold with from like a pet store or something means that that fish can't really thrive in its environment as a pet. And so when you see a fish sitting in a bowl and they're inactive and they're lazy and they're pale and all of these things, then it's really easy to dismiss fish as just a, you know, something that's boring and not interesting and, and not worth interacting with. And, and really that's just not the case at all. Yeah, there's no way to recreate a lake or an ocean, which is their natural habitat, right? So, yeah, exactly. That's that's a little bit of the the struggle with fish rescue. I think is that you know if you're looking at trying to rescue like salmon, I mean salmon grow up in freshwater and then they live their adult life in saltwater and then they return to freshwater. And and what kind of environment could you provide for a salmon, especially given their size and and everything else that they need that would ever fulfill their kind of natural life and and really there isn't as far as I'm aware there isn't like a sanctuary model for farmed food fish mm -hmm. um, and you know you can definitely have lakes and things where you can have bass and, and some of those other fish that people eat um, but even that is is that you go and you visit a lake it's not like a sanctuary type environment um, and I, I hope that we'll continue to see environmental protections that allow more of like a you know kind of an ecosystem sanctuary if you will of, of wildlife preserves and things like that that let those fish live their natural lives um, but in terms of having a fish sanctuary in the same way that you can have a farmed animal sanctuary it's, it's really not super feasible mm. um, from like a safe and just logistical standpoint I think 
In, in terms of learning about fish, I, I remember visiting the Monterey Bay Aquarium where, mm -hmm. where there's a section that is, it's just extended out into the ocean, I believe. So you yes. can sort of see, I mean, yeah. that's about as the best we can do in terms of trying to see them in their natural habitat, aside from diving or snorkeling, I suppose, hey? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and, and places like the Monterey Bay Aquarium, like that, the, if, if you're looking at something that, you know, you would call like an ethical aquarium, where um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium is in many ways a, a zoo, um, but they, they do a lot of research for environmental purposes and, and support for environmental preservation, and they do a lot of education for people, and they really do provide very good um, environments and housing for their animals. Um, and at the same time, they also advocate for the kind of responsible consumption of seafood, um, which is a little contrary to, you know, what, what vegans believe and what I believe in terms of, of how we should interact with fish in the environment. But um, a place like that still is a very good resource for learning a lot about fish and what we can do to help preserve the environment and, and really for kind of seeing fish in a natural environment or as close to what we can, can create as one. Yeah, um, but yeah. Because they are really intriguing uh, creatures, and, and so how how did you get involved with um, the Philip uh, Friends of Philip Fish Rescue, and and who's Philip? Philip is um, he's he's actually right over there. He's what he's my first fish um, and my first rescue. So about a or two years ago, um, I read on the internet that someone had had luck going to um, here at PetSmart is one of the larger pet store chains. And they found a betta fish there who was sick in those little cups and likely to die. And so they asked the manager if they could have that fish for free to help him recover. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. That sounds like a really neat thing to do. And, and I am very into, you could see I'm very into houseplants. And I had this thought of I'll set up a fish tank and I'll fill it with aquatic plants because I love plants. And then if I ever have this opportunity to rescue a fish, then I'll do that. Um, and things kind of went a little backwards where um, I was at PetSmart looking at um, aquariums and, and aquarium, you know, stuff to, to kind of see how much money I might be investing into this. And I saw this, this ultra sad little fish, his fins were rotted away, he was super skinny, he was pale and lethargic and just very clearly, even to me at that time, I, I didn't know anything about fish and he, he was going to die. Um, it was it was very clear. Um, so I took him up to the manager and I said, look, this fish is in really, really bad shape. Um, can I take him home as an adoption to try to help him recover? Um, and then they let me and I, I went through the whole process of learning how to set up a fish tank and how to establish a fish tank. Um, and that's just a whole bunch of work that you have to do, especially if you're trying to do it with fish. Um, in that in there already but uh yeah i i did that and and set up philip's fish tank and um from there it just kind of snowballed um i i rescued philip and then shortly after came across a few more fish on craigslist who needed help and and it kind of just grew from there um so i've put a lot of time and and money and things into setting up fish tanks and and trying to help these little fish who really need it um, but it was quite a journey and definitely an interesting experience. And so how's Philip doing now? Philip is doing really pretty well. Um, he is a type of betta called a rose tail betta where, um, you know, how like the petals of a rose overlap each other kind of like this. Um, his fins do that. So it's a trait that is bred specifically into fish for a specific appearance, just the same way that, you know, people breed bulldogs. Um, huh. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, uh, it unfortunately means that he has had fin problems for his whole life. Um, his, it's, it's basically with the way that the type of fish that he is, it, it works that instead of if like your hand is like this, instead of having normal kind of bone structure in his fins, his fins are, are super, super stretched out. So he mm -hmm. has the same number of bones, but it's supporting much more fin structure. Um, and that's probably way more <laughs> of an in-depth explanation than you needed. Oh, that's but, interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, it means that his fins are very heavy. And so he struggles to swim well. 
he's had problems um, periodically with actually nipping at his own fins because of the weight. That's a really common problem in very large finned bettas just like him where it's, you know, like if, if you were wearing a giant cape all the time and it were getting caught on things and, and really affecting the way that you could live, you might want to maybe cut the cape. And in, in their case, they will actually nip at their own fins out of frustration and, and kind of as a way to try to manage the size of their fins. So it's a lot of management for him, unfortunately. Um, but overall, he's very healthy. Um, he's approaching kind of upper middle age for a beta. He's probably about two years. Um, and really, they can live two to five or even seven years, but it, it depends so much on where they come from. And so, you know, Philip doesn't have necessarily the healthiest genetics. He didn't have the healthiest background or anything like that. So um, it's hard to say exactly how long of a lifespan he might have, but he's he's been doing really well. Um, and he's still healthy and he's active and he's just as goofy as all the other fish um, and really very fun. So it's, it's great that he's around and, can you know, I guess he probably doesn't know much about what he's inspired, but he's still here to see it, which is right. exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, this is kind of news to me. I mean, I just assume that um, people catch fish in the wild and then sell them in, in pet stores. I did not know there was this sort of captive breeding genetically engineering project going yeah. on. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. Um, so a lot of, I think it's about 90% of the freshwater fish that you could buy in a store would be captive bred. Um, wow. Betas are, are an interesting case uh, because they are... They've been selectively bred for a very long time. So when they were originally domesticated, it was to be used for fighting. Um, so they're exceptionally aggressive and have been basically line bred for aggression for a very long time. And so that's why you can't ever keep bettas together because they will fight and they will kill each other. And it's horrible, um, as you can imagine. Um, but now we see them as these little decorative kind of objects. And so they're bred for different colors and different fin shapes and different, you know, body shapes and all sorts of things, as you can imagine. Um, and just like you'll see, you know, if, if, a, if a bulldog has been bred irresponsibly and people aren't paying attention to the genetics of the dog, you get a lot of health problems. You get very similar problems in these fish. Hmm. Um, and Many other types of fish are also bred for, for certain appearances, like you can find quarry cats now that are, are long finned corridoras, which is a little type of catfish. They're very cute. Um, and you can find them with, with long, crazy looking fins now because people have bred them to, to have that specific appearance. Um, so it's really kind of an odd side of fish keeping that these fish are, are bred just for appearances like that. Um, but I think it, it kind of just goes into the way that fish are treated in general, which is that most people don't consider the individual when they look at getting a fish or setting up a fish tank. Um, they want a specific appearance because we've been taught that fish are decorations and that they're unfeeling and all of these things. Um, so, you know, the same thing that, that lets someone buy a fish and put it into a bowl is also what lets people breed them for specific appearances and shapes and different things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's kind of a crazy industry. <laughs> But yeah, most of them are captive bred. Um, saltwater is kind of the exception there where a lot of those fish are wild caught. Um, and that, of course, brings its own host of problems, um, both environmentally and ethically and, and all of those things. Yeah, I'd like to talk about salt versus water versus fresh water. But before we do that, let's just bust some of the myths, myths of um, fishes in general, like the idea that they aren't sentient, that they don't have personalities, that they don't feel pain. That's all kind of nonsense. And we know that now, right? Yes. Yeah. It, I mean, we've known, I think the first study that showed that fish feel pain happened in 2002. Um, so we've known for coming up on 19 years here that fish do feel pain. Um, and we may not know if, if their experience of pain is exactly the same as ours, but we know that they respond to painful stimuli. We know that they stop responding when they're introduced, when, when pain medication is introduced to the water, we know that that helps calm them down. Um, you know, there, there have been countless truly horrible experiments performed on fish, um, to, try to determine if fish feel pain and, and the overwhelming scientific consensus is they do. Um, we know that fish, fish feel 
pain. We know that they have social structures. They interact with each other and they, they find fulfillment from having a social structure. Um, they can communicate with each other. They, they kind of talk to each other at very low frequencies and things like that. And um, I think it's very easy for people to dismiss fish because it's harder to relate to them. But ultimately, we, we do know that all of those things are myths and that they can feel pain and they can suffer and that their pain and suffering is very worthy of consideration. And what about human recognition? Like, do, does Philip recognize you, do you think? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know if they specifically recognize me. There have been um, studies and in, in cases of, of like laboratory fish recognizing one person compared to others and responding to that person. Um, but the fish definitely respond to someone approaching the tank and interacting with them. Um, so every time you walk past the fish tank in my house, there's all these little fish and they're just there and they're wiggling and they're looking at you and they follow you around and they'll follow your fingers. And, um, you know, they, they're very, really interactive and observant and very curious. Every time you put something new into the tank, the fish are all wondering what it is and they're going to go check it out. Um, it's, it's pretty easy really to teach fish to eat in a certain part of the tank or that they're going to get fed in a certain part of the tank. Um, you know, fish can even be taught to, to perform tricks and, and do little mazes and, and different things like that. Um, and there's really a lot of intelligence there that I think people don't consider or, or really give credit for. Um, because it is different that you, you know, you don't really teach a, a cat, oh, sorry, you don't really teach a fish to sit the way you might a dog or even like a cat or something like that. Um, but we still have seen things like if you feed the fish in the morning on one side of the tank and in the evening on the other, they'll know within a really a short period of time to go wait at one side of the tank in the morning and then wait at the other one in the evening and, and things like that. So we know that they can learn and we know that they um, have really pretty good memories. Right. Okay. Um, so regarding Philip is now in a tank with a whole bunch of other fish then. And you mentioned that he, they're bred originally as fighters. So you wouldn't put him with another betta fish. What, what is he called? Right. Betta fish? But he's okay with other types of fish? Well, sort of. So, so Philip is alone. Um, oh. I have something like 20 fish tanks now. Oh. Um, so, oh. so there's a lot of different fish. So um, <laughs> I have quite a few tanks with just a single betta. Um, they are fairly solitary fish. Um, even in nature, they, they don't, you know, spend a lot of time hanging out with other fish. Hmm. Um, so they aren't going to be lonely or unhappy living alone. And ultimately, a lot of them will be much happier living alone. Um, but they still can do really well in a community tank with peaceful community fish. So I have um, a couple 20 gallon tanks and a couple 29 gallon tanks and I've had bettas in those at various points well I've had a single betta in there with the community fish at various points um, but then at the same time I, I had a female betta living in one of my larger tanks and I had to move her out because she was very stressed and unhappy living with other fish um, so it, it kind of you know just like us and every other animal they have their own preferences and their own unique things that'll stress them out. And, and some will do very well in a community tank and others just really won't. Um, and it can definitely depend on the type of fish too. So like I wouldn't put Philip into a community tank because he's had ongoing thin problems. And sometimes in community tanks, you might get fish that are gonna nip a little bit at each other. And if you have a long thinned fish like a betta, they're more likely to be nipped at or something like that than, uh, than others. So it's it's important to just consider what each individual fish needs and, and keep an eye on how they're doing. Um, because it's really very clear if they're stressed or if they're unhappy or, or not thriving in their environment. And it's, it's pretty easy to remedy that when it happens. Right. I mean, there is a lot of maintenance involved, you know, you got to keep an eye on their behavior. And you also, there's a lot of cleaning of tanks in your, in your home, yeah. I would guess. Yeah. How, yeah, so, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say sort of general for people who've never had, I'm sort of contemplating, I live in an apartment where I'm not, there's yeah. no animals allowed, but I'm wondering if maybe they'd allow a fish. So what's involved? Mm -hmm. what, what would I be getting myself in for? Um, the, so the, the minimum kind of expectation for, for tank maintenance would be to do a water change at least once a week. 
Um, and that really is if you're looking at a tank that's 10 gallons or larger. If you're looking at a smaller tank, like I, I personally, and I think in the larger kind of beta community, if you will, the minimum suggested tank size is five gallons. Um, so I won't keep a beta permanently in a tank smaller than five gallons. Um, but when you're looking at tanks under 10 gallons, that's kind of when you get into the more maintenance area where oh. like a five gallon tank really needs a water change twice a week. Um, yeah. can, I, can I ask what kind of water are you using? Oh, just tap water. Oh. Um, for, for fish like bettas and captive bred fish in particular, most tap water is just fine. So you don't, um, you don't have to filter it or anything? Not specifically. So you, you do use a water conditioner um, and that uh, will neutralize like chlorine and things like that. Because chlorine, of course, is, is very dangerous for fish. Um, and then the tanks themselves do have filters. Um, and that's, that's a little more like if you, know, if, if you had an apartment without a bathroom, that would be kind of like a fish tank without a filter. Um, where the filter, it keeps the tank um, clean in terms of it removes ammonia and nitrite from the, the water once the, once the fish tank cycle has been established. Um, but you still need to do partial water changes regularly and do filter maintenance to clean out any kind of gunk that accumulates and, and things like that. So um, maintenance wise, a single tank really is, is probably about 30 minutes a week if you have a 10 gallon or larger tank. It's, it's really not a giant commitment. It's just a long-term consistent commitment where you, you really need to do that every week because you know, that's what they live in and that's what they breathe and that's their whole life. And so it's, it's very easy. I think one of the most common problems I see is, is just long-term neglect of fish tanks. It's, it's very easy to get into that mindset of, oh, well, it has a filter and, and I'll, I'll take care of it next week or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, and, and every extra day that that tank goes, that's more waste that's accumulating. That's more everything that's building up in the water and is eventually going to affect the fish. So, and so you have 20 tanks with many, many fishes yeah. all together then, and are all of these fishes you're, you've rescued from somewhere, where have they come from and, and where are you hoping that they will go? Uh, that's a great question. So yeah, I, I do have, inside I have 20 tanks and then I have a few ponds outside as well. Wow. Um, and really most of them have come as kind of owner surrenders. So people on like Craigslist is the big um, classified website here. And um, a lot of people have a fish for six months and then realize that a fish tank is a decent amount of work and it's, it's work that they have to do all the time. Um, and they decide that they don't want fish anymore. Um, and then they kind of just get rid of their fish. They give them away for free on Craigslist or, or they try to sell them or things like that. And um, I will take in those fish that, that need it. Um, I won't pay people for their fish, but I, I will take them in if they're trying to find a home for their can, fish. Can you, um, why, why won't you pay for them? Um, really because it, it kind of just adds to the problem um, in, in my opinion, like with, especially like if you're looking at stores, you know, when you buy a fish, even if you see a fish there who's suffering and who is going to die and maybe management won't let you take it or, or for some reason you can't bring them home for free, once you buy them, it, it just guarantees that another fish is gonna be put into the same position. Um, so it's a little different with owner surrenders because you know you can, you can get a single fish from someone and that's, that's just fine, but a lot of the time someone is selling like their whole fish tank. Um, so I've had a few cases where I, needed another fish tank and I found one on Craigslist and I paid maybe $40 for the fish tank and then the people also gave me the fish that were living in it. Um, and so that I feel like is is reasonable because I'm paying them for this item, not not for the fish themselves. Um, so if someone's giving me just fish, I, I won't pay for them for the same reason. Um, it's a little different when it's like an, you know, a single person, it's not like they're making money off of their fish, but kind of the principle, I, I just like to try to stay consistent on that front yeah um, if we're, if we're gonna then, live, of if course we're, not buying from stores not buying from stores right and yeah i think and i heard earthling ed talking about 
a similar issue with backyard eggs, you know, why wouldn't you yeah. eat a backyard egg? And, and his explanation was that if we get to a vegan world, which is our goal, and somebody suddenly decides they want to eat those eggs, and then the neighbor wants to eat the eggs too, and then the next neighbor. And so it's a similar philosophy extending to fishes. Anytime yeah. we commodify them and put a price on their head, it it, it's really a different headspace, a different worldview, and it's not the vegan yeah. world, right? I really respect Exactly, yeah. It's, it's just reinforcing that view of them as an object to be bought and sold rather than an individual who deserves consideration of, of their quality of life. Right. Um, so yeah. there's enough people so, yeah, I, surrendering their fishes on Craigslist that you've got 20 tanks full? Is that right? It's, yeah, it's uh, to, to a degree, I, I do also do um, what I call store rescue, um, which is just like how I got Philip, where when I, you know, I, I spend a, quite a bit of money at, at pet stores, as you can imagine. Um, and when I'm there, I always just kind of glance through the fish tanks and the bettas and everything. And, and when I see one who is really just not doing well, I will bring it up to the manager and, and you know, you just be polite about it and, and recognize that um, these stores are stocked with so many animals that it's very hard to to maintain good care and things. And and um, I've I've found pretty overwhelmingly that if you're polite and know what you're talking about, managers are really happy to see an animal who's not doing well go to a home that's going to give them a decent chance of recovering and and staying healthy. Um, so I do have quite a few bettas who've come as kind of store rescues in that sense, along with a few community fish. Um, but the majority of my community fish are um, kind of Craigslist, just listings of, of people who weren't interested or um, or I've had a few people also reach out to me um, with, with fish that they realized maybe, you know, they hadn't learned proper care and they just learned about this and they don't have the resources to invest in a hundred gallon something tank for their goldfish. And so they, reach out to me and and I have ponds and so the goldfish can come here and, and live in ponds and things like that so um, it works pretty well <laughs> and and so who um, are people contacting you for rescuing as well um like yeah to, to a degree yeah um so largely it's like individual owners who um like recently I I had a a very nice woman reach out to me on Facebook because she had this goldfish that she won as a carnival prize. And she'd had her in um, a five gallon tank for, for six or seven years because she just didn't know that, that goldfish really need much, much larger space and more fish and all sorts of different things. Um, but she did learn that and she found me and she reached out to me and, and we drove, like we, she and I both drove a little over an hour to meet up in the middle so that her fish could come um, live here and, and have a better life. So um, I think a lot of it is kind of individual people realizing that the care that's usually recommended for fish is, is very, very inadequate. And, and are people contacting you to, to take fish and, and rescue them from you or are, are you oh, having all these fishes? Like to, to adopt fish? Adopt, that's um, the word, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, periodically. So it, that is one of the challenges definitely is, is finding homes for fish. Um, it can be tricky um, in part because I, I tend to have pretty strict requirements for what I'll let a fish go to. Um, so I never... I never ever taken more fish than I can care for. And I will never take in a fish if I don't feel very confident that I could keep that fish for the duration of its life if need be. Um, so having that baseline means that I do have a lot of fish, but it's, it's not too many, you know? Um, and so with that, it gives me that kind of liberty to, you know, I've, I've had a couple of times and I, and I do feel bad, but I've had a couple of times of having to, to say like, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I don't think this is the great, a great match. And, and I'll tell people why. And, and I encourage them that if they decide to set up a larger tank or if they want to go a different direction to let me know. Um, but I do, I do adopt out fish. I've adopted out a few different bettas and things and, and some community fish as well. Um, but there are definitely more people looking to um, surrender their fish than there are looking to adopt, um, which well, is 
And I guess part of it is you can't, it's not like you can ship them anywhere. Like you could put a little doggy in, a, you know, it's not the ideal situation, but people do that. They transport dogs rescue, mm -hmm. but you can't really do that with fishes, I guess. You, you can. Um, and it's, it's a little complex, you know, you have to make sure that um, the, the water temperature is as stable as possible. You can do things like put in heat packs and things. Um, I don't ship my fish. Um, I know that there are rescues that do, and I've considered it, and it, it may be something that I'll look more into in the future, but for now, I'm pretty strongly of the opinion that my fish have really been through a lot in their lives already, and so putting them through shipment seems like a, a huge thing to add to, to what many of them have already gone through. I mean, most of them were already shipped probably from like Thailand or, or somewhere similar where these fish farms are um, to be sold at a pet store. And so, you know, they have a huge long history already and then adding a shipment across the United States or something like that on top of that just feels like a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I'll look into it eventually as, as we continue to grow or, or things like that. But for now, we, d we don't ship at all. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, so well, what about uh, salt water versus fresh water? Do you have salt water tanks as well? I don't. Um, salt water, I don't have salt water tanks for a few reasons. The first is just that they're way more expensive. Um, you can very easily invest well over $100 into a single freshwater fish tank. And again, I, I don't have them, so it's a rough estimate, but I would say it's probably two or three times more expensive for salt water. Um, there's a lot more that goes into it. You need to mix salt water and, and be able to test the salinity and, and all of these things of your water to make sure that it's right, um, you know, because saltwater fish and all fish really are, are very sensitive to water parameters and water quality and, and all those things. So um, I don't have salt water in part because of the cost. And then also because where like if, if you go on to say Craigslist or something, you might on any given day, you might find a betta and some goldfish and some tetras and all these things that people are looking to just get rid of. They just don't want them anymore. They're sick of it. Um, but because of kind of the higher investment in saltwater fish, it's really, really uncommon that you find saltwater fish who someone is looking to just give away. Um, so if you do see a clownfish or something like that, it's always going to be for sale and they're going to be for sale for 200 300 dollars for the fish um and since i don't feel super comfortable like giving someone money for a fish that they're selling um it it kind of makes it a challenging area to get into in terms of like saltwater fish rescue um, right. it's something i'm definitely interested in doing in the future and i imagine at some point i'll have saltwater tanks um, but for now i'm i really focus on freshwater um and kind of the the heavy hitters if you will in the freshwater fish area which are the bettas and the goldfish and then some of the community fish as well mm. i don't have like giant indoor tanks um for cichlids and things like that i, I tend to stay on the smaller side mostly because of space <laughs> And what, and what happens when they get sick you know are there f fish veterinarians there are um there as you can probably imagine, very uncommon, unfortunately. So, um, you know, in, in my city, there are no fish veterinarians um, that I'm aware of. There are several exotic vets. So I have two um, geckos and I could take the geckos to the vet very easily. There are two or three vets in my town that I could see for, for reptiles. Um, but for fish, as far as I know, there's really nothing in my area. Um, which means, and it's, it's kind of a problem in the fish community in general, where if you ask somebody if they're going to take their sick fish to the vet, people will laugh because it, it seems to, to most people, it's like, why would I take my fish to the vet? Like, it's, it's just a fish. You know, everybody says that. And it's not just a fish. Um, but unfortunately, that mindset means that fish specialists in like the veterinary field are very uncommon. Um, and I think, you know, probably the closest area that I could go for, for a specialized fish, fish vet might be Monterey, which is about three hours away for the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
with with fish too you throw in that that transport for fish is very stressful and so if you wanted to take a fish to the vet you have to pull them out of their tank and put them into a small box and then you put that in your car and the water's sloshing everywhere and it's a very kind of stressful difficult experience for the fish um, so as we continue with the the rescue efforts i'm hoping to connect with some fish veterinarians to have that resource um, and hopefully be able to do things like right now with, with the pandemic, you know, it'll be video consultations that um, I'd love to arrange for like house visits and things like that to bring a vet here and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, for now, most of it is learning about diseases myself and treating myself. And um, it's really an interesting thing because you don't come across that with other animals, um, you know, like, there are large animal vets everywhere and farm sanctuaries take their, take their animals to the large animal vets and they have these experts and everybody who can come in. And with fish, most of the experts are fish stores and people on the internet who, have, who, who sell fish and have extensive fish kind of collections as they call them and, and things like that. And that's where a lot of that knowledge kind of comes from. So it's, it's a little more of like a tribal knowledge kind of interesting, community in that sense. I'm not sure if I'm describing it very well, but um, a lot of the common diseases are really very treatable with medications that you can just get at the fish store. Um, I, I know a lot of countries, I, I think Canada doesn't allow the sale of things like antibiotics and, and that kind of thing for fish, um, but in, in the United States, at most fish stores, you can get a pretty wide range of antibiotics, of antiparasitic medications, and all sorts of different things to, to treat fish. Um, so I, I do quite a bit of that. Wow. Can, can you think of an example or two of uh, situations that you've had some success with? Yeah. Um, so actually, Philip got a, a, a very minor fungal infection recently. Um, it's in part, it, it comes along with his, his fin troubles that he kind of just doesn't have the greatest immune system and has had problems off and on. Um, so I, I was able to treat him with a, a really common, it's called um, RID-IC. It's a, a very common medication that uses um, a, I don't know, this is, I should know more about the actual like mechanism of how all, this thing, all these things work, but there's a really common antifungal, antiparasitic medication called malachite green. Um, and a lot of it for, for treatment for fish, because you're not dosing the size of the fish, you're dosing the size of the aquarium. So the actual dosage and things like that is really pretty straightforward. So for Philip, he has a 10 gallon tank with just him. So I treated his 10 gallon tank and it cleared up very, very quickly. Wow. Um, I've also had instances of, of like fish coming in with ick. That's a very, very common parasitic disease. Um, it presents, it kind of looks like the fish is like covered in little grains of salt, um, is, is ick. And it's short for a really long <laughs> name, um, but it, it's commonly just called ick. And um, it's actually treated with the same thing that I, that I treated Philip with. So I've had a lot of fish with ick um, because it's present pretty commonly in aquariums. And then when a fish is stressed or the environment is unhealthy, or for some reason their immune system is lower, they're much more susceptible to disease, of course. So um, I do see things like ick and, and, and fin rot is a really common problem and, and the fish I see and things like that. I don't get a lot of super, super serious diseases. Um, unfortunately, because fish are so small, when they get an incredibly serious disease, they almost always are going to, to die before they come to me. Mm. Um, or even really sometimes before they get to the fish, to the pet store or before they've been home for a week, you know, they, they can really unfortunately succumb very quickly to some things. And what do you do if a fish dies? Where, where what do you do with them? Um, I personally will bury them in my garden. Um, so maybe it sounds a little morbid, I don't know, but I, I, I bury them in, in my yard um, and, you know, it, it's the area that I um, will plant like vegetable plants in and things. And so they kind of go into the ground and, just, you know, it's a little bit of a, like a return to earth kind of thing that they, they go back into the ecosystem and 
um, yeah, that's, that's really it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we all go there eventually, I guess. Exactly. I yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so I, you know, I, I just try to treat them with the dignity that they deserve. Um, I, I couldn't ever see myself like flushing a fish down the toilet or, or any of that. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I feel like if um, if you would bury your pet cat or dog or something, you should also bury your pet fish. Yeah. Um, and so, do you know of any Canadian uh, groups uh, similar to what you've set up there? Yeah, individuals? I actually I looked this up when I saw your question because it's a great question. Um, I don't know of any specifically like Canadian fish rescues, um, but I did come across the Canadian Association of Aquarium Clubs, um, and they actually have rescue resources. So um, they had a, a page on their website about fish rescue, and really the, the focus was to discourage people from releasing unwanted pet fish, which is a really significant problem. People in do the that. Aquarium. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh. Oh dear. Um, yeah, the the worst can be like goldfish, um, because goldfish are carp, and so they're a cold water fish that will be able to survive. Like if I took all of my goldfish and put them in my local lake, they would all survive, and then they would breed, and suddenly you have a goldfish population, oh, and oh. they're not native, and that's not great. Um, so yeah, releasing. Um, unwanted domestic fish is, is really a problem and either you see them become like an invasive species like with goldfish or they just die very quickly because the environment is completely inappropriate. Um, so yeah the, the Canadian Association of Aquarium Clubs um, they have a page on their website for rescue resources um, and they also suggest that you can advertise on it's a website similar to Craigslist I'm not sure how you say it. The, PGG or, or something like that. I'm, I'm not oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. I think Kijiji or something like that. Kijiji, yeah. Yeah. It's like a classified kind of um, page and that's sort of, you know, it's, it's kind of just like Craigslist. Um, and if, well, if, if you find fish listed on there, it's a great way to be able to help fish who need it. And then if you're ever, if someone's ever in the situation of needing to rehome fish, um, I hope that they're just very diligent in where those fish might end up going um, and that right. they receive the proper care and, and tank size and things. Right. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, COVID has uh, encouraged us to think of new and creative ways to be in the world and new hobbies yeah. and things to keep us busy. Maybe somebody listening would be interested in uh, set doing something similar to what, what you've done, which started with just one fish. Is there yeah. sort of a, a coalition of fish rescue people that uh, communicate with each other and support each other? You know, there, there really isn't. Um, there are a variety of Facebook groups um, that focus on fish rescue or just on fish keeping. Um, you get an interesting kind of combination of communities because even people in the aquarium hobby will sometimes laugh at the idea of a fish rescue because even though they go through all this work to set up a fish tank they, they there's still that view of fish as this commodity and this item that you you buy and then when you no longer want neon tetras in your tank you get rid of them and you put something else in mm -hmm. um so there isn't currently like a, a large network like that but it it would be wonderful to see something like that um, appear. And, and there are a variety of fish rescues through the United States. And there are quite a few people who do kind of exactly what I'm doing, um, where, you know, they have three or five or 20 fish tanks, and they bring in fish who need help and, and then try to find them new homes. Um, but as far as I know, there isn't like an organized network. Okay. So if people wanted to check out Friends of Philip, um, I guess Facebook and Instagram are your? Yeah. yeah, yeah, those are our two real, real ways to find us. Um, I'm, I'd like to eventually have a website. Um, actually, one of our big goals for 2021 is to incorporate officially and, and become a, a registered 501c3 nonprofit um, in California. And so that is kind of the first step and then we'll be looking at things like a website and and a little more infrastructure there so for now it's just facebook and instagram 
Right. Well, that's a great place to start for sure. Yeah. All I right. Is, so is there anything else, Gwendolyn? Thank you so much for taking this. Yeah. Time. Is there anything that's as weird. we go that you want to leave people with? Um, oh, that's a very good question. I think the, the main thing that I try to think about with fish in particular is that, um, you know, we don't get to see them regularly or naturally, really in any capacity. They live in an area that we don't typically think about and that we don't regularly visit in any way. You know, maybe we swim in a lake once a year or we swim in the ocean once a year or something like that, but um, they do really live these vibrant lives and have complex social structures and needs and individuality and so I just encourage people to consider that when they're um, thinking about what kind of pet they might be interested in getting or what they might want to have for dinner tonight um, and to just recognize fish in their individual um, And, and beyond that, too, I, I think it's interesting to think about fish as supplements, you know, fish oil supplement. We don't need yeah. that. We don't need no, we that. Don't. We, we definitely don't. Go for the algae, just like the fishes do, right? Like, yeah. go for the source. Mm -hmm. or fish um, fertilizers, a lot of that, a lot of fish fertilizers. Yeah, fish are, are very, very widely used. I mean, they're in pet foods, they're eaten by people, they're, like you said, they're supplements and fertilizer and so 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 many things um and really it's like you can take an algae supplement like I take an algae DHA supplement um and you can do that and you can use vegan fertilizers and you can um simply not eat fish <laughs> there's a lot of reasons to not eat fish um and that they're individuals and can feel pain is is definitely one of them but there's also you know a lot of heavy metals and and all of the pollution that we put into the ocean goes into the fish um they they live in the water and they breathe the water and the things that we put into the water are found also in their bodies um and so looking strictly at what you're putting into your body when you're eating fish there's a lot of things in there that you you probably really don't want um and it's it's really good to just avoid all of that and look for the plant-based options instead. Here, here. All right. Well, let's do it. <laughs> 2021 will be the year of the fishes. That would be wonderful. And that'd be great. Okay. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn. Yeah. Thank you.